I think we're ready to go. Um, I expect we'll still have some people coming in um, once we get started, but mm -hmm. I want to stay on schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and begin. Uh, mm -hmm. Hello to everybody and welcome. My name is Susan O'Handley and I am one of three co-presidents for the Delaware at Seagull Audubon Society, which is also known as DOAS. Our moderators for this evening are co-president Becky Gretton and DOAS treasurer, Charlie Schein. Um, thank you all for logging in with us tonight for our virtual program with Rick Bunting. Some of you may have seen our announcement slides, but I wanted to review a few of these together with you before we move on. Um, let me just get the bird song stopped from the background on my computer. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so we're heading into our 54th anniversary celebration of our charter as a chapter of National Audubon Society. And our event this year will again be held digitally on Friday, October 15th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Um, many of our members are probably aware that we've postponed our annual bird seed fundraiser um, due to the recent issues with an unknown bird illness. And we are relying a little bit more heavily on our annual bucket raffle and hope that you might support with the purchase of some tickets for some beautiful prizes. All of the items that are uh, available for raffle are displayed at our website at www.doas.us. The drawing will take place following our keynote presentation at our charter celebration on Zoom on October 15th. The speaker for the celebration will be author and researcher Scott Widensaw. You may remember Scott from our April presentation on bird friendly coffee and bird migration. Um, if you may have, if, if you missed that, um, definitely encourage going back and watching. It was an incredibly informative program and you can get an idea of um, Scott and why we selected him to present for our charter uh, dinner this year. Um, his presentation next month will be about the Northern Sawwet Owl, 25 years of late nights and wee owls, and that program will begin promptly at 7.30 p.m. All of our past programs are at our website, doas.us slash webinars. On Saturday, October 2nd, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m., please join us at the DOAS Sanctuary on Franklin Mountain for our Hawk Watch open house. We'll have a Hawk ID workshop followed by a guided trail hike and children's activities. And then at 1230, a special presentation featuring live raptors with Missy Runyon of the Friends of the Furred and Feathered Wildlife Rehabilitation Center. Free refreshments will be available throughout the day and we'll also be selling our raffle tickets bird-friendly coffee, and our DOAS reusable bags and more. If you would like to place an advance order for coffee or bags, um, please contact Jane Backman. You can find her contact information at our website at doas.us. For this evening's program, we're going to run things a little bit differently based on um, the, the time constraints that we have and also the number of people um, we've had stellar registration, um, almost 165 people who are registered for this evening. Um, we'll kind of look at those numbers of people probably coming in and out. Um, so well, we're going to be holding all of our questions and answers until the end and get to as many of them as we can. So if you have questions, please feel free to submit them throughout the program by using the Q&A button on the Zoom panel. And you can type us a question. And if our moderators are able to answer that, um, we will do that in real time. And then those that we can't answer, we're gonna hold to the end and basically get to as many as we can. Um, any unanswered questions at the end of the night, um, once we close the program down, we'll submit to Rick and we can follow up with an email um, probably to the group. So 
um, we will basically connect with you through the Zoom information that you submitted just to you know, share those answered questions with everybody. Um, so that's all I have for, for us for this evening for announcements. Um, we're happy to be back in, you know, on our schedule with programming again. We're sorry that it can't be in person, um, but we look forward to opening up and seeing where things go, um, hopefully in the spring. So uh, keep an eye out for information um, through our Facebook page and our website and sign up for our evenings if you don't get them. Uh, over to Becky Gretton to introduce our speaker for the evening. Thank you very much, Susan. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Rick Bunting is Professor Emeritus from the Crane School of Music at SUNY Potsdam, where he served as Chair of Music Education and conducted the renowned Crane Chorus. Since his retirement from teaching, he has devoted a great deal of time to his passion as an amateur naturalist. He enjoys taking pictures of what he sees and sharing them where, whenever he can. And we are grateful that Rick is once again sharing with us tonight. Welcome, Rick. Thank you. I don't know whether you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'll get back to the start of this program here. Let me get back to the beginning. Sorry. We, uh, let me do end of show here and start all over again. How's that? That's good. You just need to share your screen, Rick. Something, something got uh, run amok there. Sorry. Okay, let's see. Now you have my screen? Yes. Okay, now I can start, <laughs> yay. And I wanna thank, um, as always, the wonderful crew at um, the DOAS because they're, um, it's an exceptional group and um, the work that they're doing for all of us related to the environment and related to uh, the natural world uh, is incredible. It's an incredible group. If you just go to their website and look at the variety of things that they have uh, available for you to see and do, um, it's an it's an amazing group. And I'm I'm always very grateful for the opportunity to share um, with them and with you. Um, one of the advantages, I guess, of the uh, Zoom presentation is that. Um, I have a feeling that there are some folks out there who wouldn't have been in Oneonta tonight if we were if we were doing a meeting there, um, and that's that's a wonderful thing, and and I'm I'm happy for that, and I wish I could I wish I could greet you all, but so this evening um, this is a chance to share with you some of my favorite photos and the stories related to them um, that have happened so far this year. Um, it's been a, it's been a very interesting year and one of the highlights has been the, um, the green herons. And so we're, we're starting with a couple of slides of the, of those green herons. And actually we're going to come back to them at the end of the, at the end of the program. We, I, the program will be essentially chronological, although of course that's actually impossible to do a day-by-day -day thing, but um, we'll, do, we'll do our best here to, uh, to keep you moving through the year, uh, beginning in January. And this was my backyard on January the 1st, um, literally January the 1st. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is where we all started here in the Northeast. Um, and, uh, I was out taking some pictures and actually was in a snowstorm taking a picture of a, of a green heron or a great blue heron, sorry, on, uh, January the 18th and saying to this bird as it was flying by, you've got 
to get going. You only have two months before you're going to be back here in the swamp raising children. Get get going. So, so needless to say, you don't want to spend all your time out in the snowstorm. So what do you do? You get a cup of coffee, you sit by the window, and you start looking at your feeders. Um, I take great I take great delight in taking these feeder pictures in the in the winter time. Um, I have a little arrangement in in my kitchen about off the kitchen uh, where I can put a panel in the window and with minimal um, cooling effect, get my camera outside to take some some pictures of the of the various birds like this white breasted nuthatch. The um, the great delight of of looking at birds this way is you get to see them in ways that you don't ordinarily see them. This is a dark eyed junco or a slate colored junco as some of you might have learned it. Um, and you would say to yourself, yeah, that that looks a lot like slate colored juncos, but this is also a slate colored junco. <clears throat> and so we get to look at the feeders and study things like plumage that changes, same species, but my goodness, what a what a neat thing to see. One of the favorites, of course, that everybody has at their feeders, the red-bellied woodpeckers, you know, but how often do you get to see that that feather dew at the back, which really, which really stands out and makes, first of all, it makes him a male. And second of all, that's one heck of a hairdo right there. Wait, looking at a at this morning dove, um, until I started photographing birds at feeders fairly close, uh, I never looked at the etchings on the bills of these birds. When I first saw it, I thought it was probably just scraping from them digging into things, but it turns out that that's actually a feature of them. And this is a male uh, because he has a little pink in his vest there, as you can see, in spite of the fact that he has one heck of an eyeliner job right there, that's for sure. Sometimes the church lady is looking at me in the morning. Those of you who remember Saturday Night Live, well, is that you again with that camera? My goodness. <laughs> and uh, let's talk about the underdog, you know, the beautiful plumage of our starling. This guy needs no introduction, of course. He's everybody's feeder favorite and uh, one of ours as well. We were unlucky this year. Uh, we didn't have any red poles. We didn't have any um, evening gross beaks at our feeders or any of the other wintering birds that other people were getting. But we did have pine siskins and had a, a, a nice opportunity to look at the incredible variety of plumage of, of these birds. We also had our overwintering um, Carolina Wren, the, the guy who will sing to us in the middle of February and January. He also nested in a begonia plant on our front porch this summer and treated my wife and myself to an extended uh, study of the varieties of song that this bird produces, you know. I always like to take the pictures where if you look into the eye, you'll see the reflection of my house. And um, that's, it's, it's a, a, a humbling thing to see yourself in the eye of a, of a blue jay. A couple of uh, quick stops here with, with perennial favorites. Did my send, of course, the little guys, <clears throat> our chickadee dees. And unfortunately, we do have a resident uh, immature, although this year, obviously, if he comes back, he won't look quite like this. But this Cooper's hawk um, does his damage, and um, we do our best to tolerate him. Uh, actually, we have no choice, to be perfectly honest with you. When he comes, he rules the roost. But there are other things that we have to look to do and to see in nature in the winter time. And so one of those things is hoarfrost. You know, if the temperature is right and there's no wind and the humidity is high, 
get yourself out there in the morning if you possibly can, because nature is providing a, a, a show that will diminish just as soon as the sun strikes. Um, but it's a, it's a marvelous show, uh, even to the point where nature had created a bow on this farmer's brand new um, fence and then also decided to decorate it as well. You can find other things than birds to look at as well in the wintertime. Um, the muskrats do come out. Uh, this one was practicing his reed instrument, as you can see. Um, I think he was playing the muskrat ramble, but I'm not sure. It, that, that's the sound I thought I got, you know. And not only was he playing, but his partner also plays. And as you can see, he just put his instrument down and let her have, let her have the ice or the floor or whatever. Another nice feature of the wintertime are nature's abstracts that are produced on, on walls and in place, rocks and places where ice forms um, and these marvelous abstracts that nature produces. Uh, so I got a little gallery of them together here for you. Um, this one shows a little emphasis on color. The, the show changes depending on the light. And of course, depending on if there is a thaw, you go back the next day and it's a brand new painting for you. Sometimes the encasement of um, plants that, that existed on the wall or wherever you're looking um, also is a, a wonderful abstract the ice itself, the design, the beautiful structure of the uh, of these paintings is incredible stuff. Every once in a while, somebody floats in from outer space. I, I don't know. This image caught me uh, on on the on the wall one day, um, and I thought, I don't know who she is, but she's a mysterious character. That's for sure. You also find mysterious things in the streams. If you have little brooks or streams that you can get to, it's wonderful to check out the ice formations. Um, they give a, a beautiful variety of design and color. Uh, the color begins to come in when the sun strikes them. You can see little aspects of blue happening in this particular. And sometimes it's the stream itself that uh, provides an abstract. Um, with, with what happens at the stream bed. Um, this is a, where I take the camera and put it at a very high shutter speed, the highest shutter speed I can, and take a picture when the sun is shining on the, um, on the stream itself and on the stream bed. Fantastic pictures, fantastic pictures, wonderful aspects of color that happen. So there is stuff to see out there in the wintertime. That's what I'm saying. And when spring comes, you can go back to that stream and still take some more abstracts um, <clears throat> when the plants begin to form. But I don't, I don't want to make you think that we didn't have winter birds. We did have winter birds this year. This was the first time in my area <clears throat> in... Oh, I, I remember possibly seeing one approximately 30, 35 years ago in our area. I've seen them other places in the state, of course, but this guy was there. Um, never came terribly close, but it was pretty exciting <laughs> you know, to, get, to get to have a snowy owl that you could drive and be pretty sure that that owl was going to be in the same, in the same place. Uh, he had two or three spots in this field where he visited, and uh, it was an absolute delight. And we did have a, a little visitation. Uh, this is the first time also that I have ever seen crossbills in, in my area. They are in Shenango County, um, or I mean, in, in northern part of New York State, I should say, but and in, even in northern Shenango County. But in my area, we haven't had them, and it was a great delight to get a chance to see them and actually get a decent picture of, of one of the females. Um, I'm hoping, I'm hoping this year that this, the spruce cone 
things will will multiply and we'll get to see more of this bird. One of our favorite winter birds, of course, are the rough leg hawks. Um, this is a dark form of the rough leg hawk. They come in two, two basic varieties, the dark form and the light form. Um, this is a light form female. She has that very dark band across her, her stomach. But the one that took my fancy was this one. Um, I called it George for some reason to start with. I don't know when I started seeing this bird. <clears throat> and when it flew into my life, it was absolutely uh, wonderful. It was a great winter diversion. Um, the reason it was great was because this bird came to the same place every morning, um, which was a little surprising to me. I mean, considering the open fields we have for it to hunt in, um, and this was its place. And I never really quite understood why I could always drive up. And by the way, got to the point where I could drive up, get out of the car and take pictures of this bird walking right up, walking right up to the bird. Um, well, the reason was I found out this was uh, right in front of a shop. And I was talking to the shop owner one day and he says, you know, we don't have very many mice this winter in the shop. And I said, aha. Now I know why this bird is on this post every morning, you know, but what a delight to be able to take other people there and say, I'm going to show you a rough leg hawk, get your camera ready because you're going to be able to take pictures. And when that bird sat on that pole and looked down at us um, with no fears, no fears whatsoever of us, uh, allowed us to watch all kinds of preening and uh, exposure of gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous feathering that this bird has, you know. And here's what will undoubtedly be the, ca the calendar shot this year of this bird. But um, great homage to George, who actually I believe is Georgette. Um, we, are, we waffled around about this. I did have an expert come down and we actually tried to trap her to, to find out for sure. And she took the trap and she picked it up and carried it up in the air and dropped it on the ground. So that was the end of that. That's the end of our possibility of knowing who she is. You know, Of course, we do have turkeys. We do have turkeys. But the one that really amazed me was this guy. I saw him several times work, working through the burdock and I said, how does he fly with this burdock stuck all over him? But evidently it didn't seem to bother him because he, he took the same route up, up through the burdock every morning. Whose tail this is, I think I know, <laughs> right? We, this is what we look for in the wintertime. We say, ah, we're, we're in red tail hawk territory. And I have to tell you, this is the way I see a lot of them, right? And I, so I was a little... A little unexpected to see one sitting in the snow one day in the middle of the field, but that's okay. We will take you in the middle of the field, you know. This is Maud and Harold. For those of you who follow my posts, you're well aware of Maud and Harold. Um, and this is the wintering time where they begin to gather and um, they start to fuss around with the nest a little bit. They've been doing it a little bit through the fall as well. Um, and eventually, of course, leading toward their mating, which will happen in February, March, depending on, on the year as to when they want to get started. But I caught them at, a, at one of their um, together moments in a snowstorm one day. And uh, so here's a little sequence. That's Maud on the right and Harold on the left, and you can see she is a much larger bird than, than he is. But she's saying something to him. Um, bill touching is huge in birds, as you know, uh, in terms of communication. And um, posturing is also a huge thing. Um, they did not mate this day. I thought perhaps they would, but it was actually a little early. Um, but it wasn't too much later than he was beginning to show his his male stuff to her in the um, 
in the nest. And I thought, well, it can't be, it can't be too long. I wasn't there for it. Um, my wife calls me a voyeur anyway, you know, because I take pictures of these birds breeding. Um, they did breed and uh, Maud went on to the nest, but of course, winter was not over. So on this nest is Maud somewhere um, underneath the snow, incubating eggs, which she did produce too. And we'll take a look at those guys in, in just a little while. Well, this is what we wait for, I guess. Uh, more and more robins are overwintering with us. So sometimes it's hard to tell whether you're looking at the first robin of spring really or not. But this was a part of a flock that had come in. And it was the, so this is the first robin that I saw. And just like all of the early birds that we're gonna be looking at, they do pay a price. And so this is the angry bird. <laughs> deciding why, why did I take the early flight? You know, this is right along with them. Of course, come the red wings, hunting in, in my area, hunting out the cattails. They love the cattails where they can get into the seed. It's, it's fun to watch the stuff fly. And right with them usually are the swamp sparrows. Um, this one was serenading me. Um, an early, um, yeah, an early hawk, returner, you know, we, um, we have harriers in our area, and a couple of years ago, we had them nest, and we knew where the nest was. Um, we haven't been able to pin down a nest in the last couple of years, um, but they're here. As a matter of fact, I saw one today, um, but they're all, they will return quite early and did last year as well. And another one that we always wait for, of course, and doing more overwintering as well. Um, nothing quite like seeing bluebirds in early spring. Um, and here she is. Um, I don't want to anthropomorphize, but uh, she looks like she's having a reflective moment before she begins the whole breeding process here. Actually, they were fighting for this close by house here. Unfortunately, they lost out this year to this couple. Um, they beat them out last year and had the had the uh, the premier spot. Well, it's premier in terms of me being able to take their picture. Let's put it that way. They are, however, also a beautiful blue bird. So no complaints. Different activities at the swamp this year with the great blue herons. Previous to this, I have. Uh, always said, um, perhaps a little bit too authoritarianly, uh, that the males come back first and they work on an existing nest or they start to build a, and wait for the females to come back. Well, this year, an entirely different story. The first pair that I saw was in a rainstorm and they were a pair already sitting on the nest. Two and three days later, the nests that were occupied were occupied by a pair. I have never seen this before. Uh, I've been watching them at this swamp for over 15 years. And uh, historically, the males have come back, waited for the females, courted a female. But there's no question this year that they arrived at the swamp paired up. How it happened, where it happened, why it happened. I have no idea, but it did. This was the third day. This was the third day I was seeing them at the at the swamp. Um, of course, they had to fight the interloper problem. Uh, he, you might you might think you have a couple, but there's always another male that's trying to trying to uh, intercede there. This is the matriarch of Nest Four. Um, we're going to come back to her. We're gonna follow her children through this program. So this is her um, very early. Um, she had just paired up or, or came back paired up, I should say, with a, with a male. And he was off gathering sticks. 
and she posed for this lovely picture of her. Now, unfortunately, once she had made it and was incubating her eggs, she also paid the price for April snowstorms. Um, I don't know whether you remember April 1st <laughs> this year, for those of you in the North, but it was a heck of a snowstorm. And it caught her off guard, but she, of course, knew how to handle it. Another early starter at the swamp, of course, is the, are the geese. And they obviously come back paired because they mate for life. And there is a tremendous amount of chasing that goes on as males try to um, take a female that's already spoken for or get too close to a nest. The, the mating starts with uh, the dipping, which, which um, a number of waterfowl do, dipping their head in the water and throwing it back. Um, this, this was her actually doing it, but the real action doesn't happen until they do it together. Um, once, they, once you see a pair doing the dipping together, you know it's pretty close to copulation time. And um, then she took off and uh, set up shop. She had already started a little bit on uh, an abandoned um, lodge, beaver lodge, that was occupied by muskrats. But she, she was on the top, but of course she was also caught in the, in the snowstorms that happened in April. Shorebirds this year, we missed our snipe this year. The field that, that has um, historically been good for snipe, they come very early in April, usually, quite early in April. Um, and the, there was not enough water in this uh, extended cornfield, extension of a cornfield that uh, does uh, occupy an area where the, the shorebirds can go. But we did get um, our solitary sandpipers and our yellow legs in there. Um, the, my favorite picture, I think, of the, of the solitary is this photograph from this year. Um, remember, this is, the bird, this is the bird that looked quite a bit like a spotted sandpiper, and as nature would have it and lo loves her own little twists, uh, it's the solitary sandpiper that has spots on its back and the spotted sandpiper that has a plain back with no spots. So when we're looking at them at this time of the year, we're saying, thanks a lot, nature. This is, this is all I need. I'm having enough trouble here. Actually, I think this is my favorite kind of photograph with them. It's wonderful taking pictures of these birds doing their morning baths, you know. Well, there are other birds to see that come back early and start nesting. This was the first time up at the swamp I've been able to photograph um, a family of red-breasted nuthatches setting up. <clears throat> he did the whole drilling for the most part. And um, together they, they did the cleaning out of the inside. They would come to the uh, opening and disperse of the junk that they didn't want in there. Um, he would bring her <clears throat> food in the process of the nest building. And I want you to notice that around the nesting hole, you can see that there's a glaze that has been put on. Now that's pine pitch that they put on as an insect repellent. Um, <clears throat> clever little device that they use. And you can see it actually a little better maybe in this picture. He would bring her food um, while she was incubating. I have to tell you, we had the big three <clears throat> nesting there together all at the same time red-breasted, white-breasted nuthatches, and brown creepers, and I didn't see any of them emerge as young. They, it's, it's one of those things that if you're not there on the right day at the right time, they all come out and they're gone. Um, I, you do see them around the swamp, don't misunderstand me. But I, I last year had that you know, fortunate thing of watching the little, the little white breasts that's come, come out of the hole, but not this year. 
with the red breasteds. And this is the male. <clears throat> I want to include this picture to show you that, that glaze that he has constructed around there as the insect repellent. The white breasteds were in the same hole that they've nested in for the past three years. Um, this was their early nesting. They also had a later one. Um, <clears throat> he was, he's a he's a doting male. He really is. He um, he would bring her lots of food when they were in the process of nest building. Um, he would also carry most of the nesting material <clears throat> to the nest. Sometimes a pretty good load, <laughs> a pretty good load that he had a little trouble. It was a little bit of the uh, square peg and round hole thing going on here. <clears throat> this was this is their way of dealing with insects. They they do a thing called sweeping. They'll take a bug and kill it, and then with its with the bill, you know, kind of squishing down on the on the bug, they will sweep all around the edge of the nest, actually all around the tree. And both both uh, the male and the female will do this. This is her. <clears throat> I, I caught the, uh, the great blue in a reflective mode, so I thought it would be fun to have a reflective mode of the female thinking about what have I gotten myself into here. Um, but eventually the young were there and this is him bringing them off. And if you look very carefully, right past his feet, you'll see an open mouth in there waiting, waiting for that food to arrive. It's a little hard to see, but it's there. And here's the, here's the creeper. They bond their material for their nest together with, um, the silk of, of spiders and cocoons. Um, and here he is gathering it and bringing it into the hole. Brown creepers figured out a long time ago, unlike that, that uh, nuthatch who has to stuff the materials into the hole. They figured out a long time ago how to get something into a, a slot like this. It's wonderful to watch them. They'll come up and they'll try it and then they'll reposition it in their mouth and they'll turn and they'll take it in and make their, make their nest. And as I said before, I never got to see the young come out, but the, it was wonderful to see the adults working, working the nest for sure. We're gonna talk about the birds that come slightly after that first wave and representing the migrants that come and don't stay um, is this white crowned sparrow, just an absolutely beautiful bird. Um, I could have given lots of other birds here, but I thought this was a stunning bird. And um, he'll go on up into the Adirondacks, maybe even Northern Shenango County. And, and nest in the, in the Farsalia woods up there, but not, not in our area. Everybody likes the yellow warbler coming back, but I like this yellow warbler, which is a pine warbler um, because he's an early, early woodland warbler, very cooperative. Not too far behind was the chestnut sided. Um, one of my favorite warblers and one of my favorite birds. Um, I guess another favorite we'd have to say <laughs> when it comes to warblers, um, I could run them up here, Blackburnians and Black-throated Greens and Black-throated Blues and everyone would be the next favorite, right? One that's been around, but this was such a statuesque, beautiful, beautiful wax wing that um, was started actually the early nesting in the fields. We'll let the kingbird be the representative of the, um, of the flycatchers. And in the shrub fields, we'll let the prairie warbler be the representative of, of those birds. 
down on the river and they come, everybody waits for the hoodies. <laughs> they are among, they're one of the, oh, birds, aren't they so cute? They, and they are, they are. And their cousin, the common merganser, one of the folk uh, terms for this bird is a sawbill. And you can see in this particular picture that he does have a sawbill. He does have a serrated edge that he holds on to the fish, with, with which he holds on to the fish. Sorry to my English teaching friends. If you happen to have a barn, you're lucky because this, I, I think this is a really overlooked bird in terms of lining up beautiful birds. The barn swallow is gorgeous. It is a spectacular bird. Um, wonderful to watch them uh, build their nests. And talk about late feeder arrivals. This is when we get out the orange peels and the grape jelly and look for these guys. Um, and the, when the Orioles come in our yard, <clears throat> right with them are the hummingbirds because we have flowering quince bushes and they both come uh, within a day of each other. They will be in the yard. We're going back to that. You remember that mama goose that was sitting underneath the snow incubating her eggs? Here's the results. <laughs> Talk about cute. Oh my. There were five. There are, you can see four in this picture. I don't know where number five was at the time. Um, they spent one day on the lodge. Uh, and at the end of that day, they had them in the water. And that was it. They were in the water permanently after that. And they joined four other families uh, there were five total uh, goose families on the, on the swamp this year. And do you remember the, uh, the matriarch having her, her kids? Well, here they are. This is number one. This is her with that one little white fluffy thing <laughs> sticking its head up. And here's a couple of days later, with a, a little pile now she's beginning to gather and she actually had four uh here here you can see them a little bit older we're doing a little chronology run here <clears throat> and here a little bit older um still can't see still can't see number five in there or number four in there well you can i guess it's behind the other one but We'll follow those four in a, in a little bit, but there are other young that are waiting, waiting to be seen. Now, I just heard a collective, oh, go around. Um, there's nothing quite as cute as, as a kit fox. Um, and these, these foxes were a delight. I got to photograph them three or four times. It was a a process of taking a little bit of time to get to them, of course. Um, the pair on the right was exceptional to me. Um, they were always together. Um, and I assume it was the same too. Um, the others, there were, there were five altogether. Um, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes the protective one seemed to get a little bit a little bit harsh with his little partner his little buddy there you know what I mean but there were some incredible snuggling moments here you know what what a gorgeous pair they were and here's my final portrait of them um I hated I hated to see them get older to tell you the honest truth this is the time of the year when we begin to look for wild flowers, our favorite roadsides. Um, chicory is a big one for me. Um, also a big one for flower flies, as you can see. Uh, I have to tell you, I bought a book on flower flies. It's a thick book. Um, 
I had good intentions of trying to be able to tell one flower fly from another. Now, remember, these things, first of all, almost have to be photographed because they're, they're about a half an inch to a three quarters of an inch. And so there's no way you can discern the, the markings on them without taking pictures of them. But I decided that I really like the category of just plain flower fly. I think that works just fine for me. Here's another one. And this is on the, the queen's lace, <clears throat> which is another plant that we just wait for at the roadside. And of course the bees wait for it as well. Interesting looking at all the little pollen sacks that he's gathered up on his feet and on his legs that he's carrying around with him. Talk about it being a major pollinator. But here's for the underdog, the bumblebees who are of course our native species. Um, and this is on, on uh, spotted knapweed which is a plant that a lot of people like to get rid of if they're gardeners, uh, but it's a major attractor for insects and for butterflies. It's also, <laughs> it'll get these guys too, but this one happens to be on a daisy. We not only see the, the insects, but we see the prey, the, the guys that are coming to get them, the predators. This is a, a flower, crab spider. This is, this is the guy who can change his color. It doesn't happen very quickly, but he does adapt his color to his environment. This is an ambush bug. Um, normally there's inside of a flower. He was sitting on top of this. Um, it's not a daisy. It's a, anyway, it'll come to me. Um, so he, he was just posing for this picture. I couldn't believe it. Look at those pinchers on the front of him that he, that he grabs with. When the dog bane comes out, out comes the dog bane beetle. Uh, kind of a favorite beetle, of course. Unfortunately, it's a little bit close to the Japanese beetle in, in coloration, but it's a magnificent beetle. Uh, this is actually on Indian hemp, which is a kind of dog bane. Out comes the bone set. And when it, the bone set comes out up at the swamp, we start looking for my favorite caterpillar. This is the camouflage caterpillar. There's a, there's a caterpillar in there. And what he does is he gathers little pieces of detrius from the flower and he sticks them on his back. Now with this one, you can see that, that little, those little, little fuzzy spikes that he has on his on his uh, back that hold the stuff that he sticks it on. It's amazing. Sometimes they get so decorated that there's no way you can even find the caterpillar inside. You know, speaking of finding something, here's the primrose moth. When the, when the evening primrose comes to the side of the road, we start to look for the moth that crawls in there in the daytime and spends, um, spends a day beautiful pink and white moth. I wanted to include um, a macro shot of a tiny moth, just as a representative of the incredible, um, what shall we say, diversity of design and color that goes by unnoticed actually. This is a big moth. This is a gallium sphinx moth. That was, by the way, a, an orange spotted um, proster moth. This is a, um, a gallium sphinx moth or a, or a bed straw hawk moth. A, a, a very attractive moth, very large, very large. Actually as large as the hummingbird moths. And we'll put this, this butterfly up on spotted knapweed because the sulfurs are with us throughout the year and um, we're gonna come back to them. And there's one of those hummingbird moths also, of course, on spotted knapweed. Well, what about milkweed? Well, when we get to milkweed, we know what we're looking for. We're looking for these little caterpillars who get to be good sized caterpillars. And one of the things I'm always looking for 
is a female laying eggs on, on the milkweed. Now, the books will tell you they lay them on the, on the leaves and um, under the leaves usually and on top of the leaves, but they also lay them uh, on, the, on the pods and they lay them amongst the buds of the flowers. Um, what I like to, to do is to be able to get a picture of the butterfly laying the egg and then get a picture of the egg that she just laid. And this is the one that she just put there, buried in the buried among the flowers, what will be the flowers of the milkweed. Hanging from the milkweed, one of my favorite insects. This, you know, the phantom crane fly is a, a it's it's an insect, which means it has six legs, right? But this one only has three. Well, this insect has a, the capability of detaching legs when they get caught in spider webs or by prey. So this one's down to three, but still hanging on pretty well. A little bit of a leaf hopper. This is actually called a flower hopper, I think. This is the reason I do this macro photograph for you is because this occurs as a little green spot on the leaf. But when you look at it, it's a pretty interesting looking character. Katie dids all over the milkweed. I love this one. This is a slender meadow Katie did. And you talk about an ovipositor. That's one heck of an ovipositor this gal has, you know. And I imagine it keeps some people away when she doesn't want them there as well. Giant, giant wasp. This is a, an ichneumon wasp. The tail on this wasp is much larger than the wasp itself, curls it up like a fly fisherman behind it. Um, this is the first time I've, I've seen one at the swamp with on the milkweed. Well, we're back to that gal and her kids here. <laughs> here she is. Those kids have gotten pretty, pretty good size. And this is when the feeding gets really tough on the adults. Um, the scrums, as we call them. Uh, this is a, a close-up look at a scrum. They're down there waiting for the food to drop out of her mouth. She regurgitates her food. And down it comes. And then... All hell breaks loose and it's on. And this picture will tell you what happens with the size of these young. The adult on the right is standing um, up in the nest, as you can see, and the young are now every bit as big as she is. And this is a photograph taken just before the fledging began. Um, at the swamp this year, we had uh, th uh, we had 11 nests originally, then down to 10 that were actually active. Um, and we fledged 23 young great blue herons out of that swamp this year. Frogs are a big feature in our area at swamp and at other places. Pickerel frogs green frogs. I want you to take a quick look at this green frog and we'll talk a little bit about ID here. Notice the ridge that goes along the frog's back. That's characteristic of a green frog. Notice its tympanic membrane, the large circle behind its eye. Uh, notice that it's larger than its eye. That means this is a male. So with those two ID things, we can say this is a male green frog. And even looking at this bullfrog here in the middle, in the lower, we can say this is a female, because you'll notice her tympanic membrane is smaller than her eye. But the feature of this photo is what's behind her in the water. Um, that's a tadpole. The tadpole process with, with bullfrogs takes over two years to develop to an adult frog. So it's not that quick tadpole to frog in one season, um, and it's, a, it's an extended process. First of all, they look like this in the spring, no legs, then the hind legs come, then the front legs come, 
And now they develop lungs so that they can breathe out of the water and they will crawl out of the water still with the tail, which will be absorbed and the nutrients in it. And by the end of this season, by October, this will be an adult. This will finally be an adult frog. Had a couple of fun things we, we photographed with frogs this year. This is a frog um, shedding its skin. This is one of those things in nature that we know they do it. They do it very often, sometimes every other day, every few days, they'll shed their skin. They have to because the skin gets brittle and they can't, they can't breathe through it. So this is a frog shedding its skin, which by the way, it will then eat for the nutrients in it. Um, I don't know how many times I've photographed frogs, thousands and thousands of times. I've photographed them shedding their skin three or four times, you know. This was a fun thing from a little while ago that I sent out. We, we don't normally see frogs catching fish, but this guy did. Uh, actually had a little spectator bug there on the, on the back waiting to see if he was actually gonna get this down, which he did, he did get it down. And we're gonna pay homage to the matriarchs. Every year we call the largest female frog Manalema because that's the name of a, of a chief of uh, the Shawnee tribe. And the reason we had to pick an Indian chief was because of course, this is Sitting Bull. Um, and this is the sitting bull of this year, and he is a very large bullfrog. But this was my favorite fic picture of frogs of the year and everybody else's favorite too. This is the bullfrog doing the croak with the vibrations being carried in the water around him. You know, this is, this is one of my favorite photos that I've ever taken, so... There are other animals swimming around, vibrating the water up there, however. And this is, this is one of the muskrats who was living in that lodge. Um, he, muskrats, like beavers, do not see particularly well. Uh, they smell well, but they didn't, he didn't um, seem to matter. It didn't seem to matter to him that I was fairly close to him. And now we have a story to tell of climbing every mountain. We saw this young killdeer at the bottom of this hill. Um, and we thought, my goodness sakes, it's starting to go up the hill. And it did start to go up the hill. And one time it made it all the way almost to the top of the hill under the guard of its mother. And it tumbled all the way back down again. And we thought, oh my God, what are we gonna witness here? This is crazy, you know? But it finally went up there and it finally went over the top, just like that. Too much applause from Tanner and myself who were standing down at the bottom of the hill. And there were some people, this is fairly close to a lumber yard. And there were some people standing around wondering, what are those guys standing over there applauding about? You know. Well, we have to talk about the Eagle Babies. This is one of them. This is both of them from this year. Um, it's a hard nest to see them in because of the position of the nest. So we don't even know who's there for a long time. But it was, it was fun to follow them again this year. Um, and they're finally getting, they finally got to their, their wing exercises and they're full size. Uh, they're full size when they fledge. And this picture was taken one day before they fledged. Uh, actually, one fledged first, the one on the left. She, I think that's a pretty sure that's a female. And she, uh, she took charge and fledged a couple of days before the, uh, the fellow on the right. We had a pretty good year for butterflies with some species and not so good with others. Uh, I did get to see my favorites, the bronze coppers. This is a female. Um, I got to see butterflies that I hadn't seen in several years. Um, Baltimore checker spots. Talk about a spectacular butterfly. I mean, they are, they are incredible. And to be able to see multiple of multiples of them together was, was a real treat. 
And I include another uh, close-up picture of of a creature. Uh, this is a red admiral butterfly, simply to show the incredible design and color that it's very difficult to see these things with the naked eye. Uh, and this is why you grab yourself a camera and you go out there and you take your pictures. Dragonflies, good year for dragonflies at the swamp. This is a pond side um, club tail and uh, not a common one. And so it was fun to have them back there this year. This is a common butterfly. Um, the slaty skimmer to me is a beautiful, beautiful butter uh, dragonfly. It's uh, sleek, an intense, intense blue uh, color. And here's a mixture of color on a on a on a uh, uh, it'll come to me. <laughs> anyway, this this uh, this is a mixture of the blue and the yellow and the black on a blue dasher. That's what his name is. Now I told you we'd come back. I told you we'd come back to these guys because this has been an exceptional year for watching green herons at the, at the swamp. And so the photography has been um, superb. I mean, I'm, down, I'm not saying the photography, the ops, the photo ops were superb. Um, we got to see them do all of the types of hunting that they do, all the positions. We got to take these kind of pictures where the incredible skill of being able to plunge into the water and send your bill through water shield and get a fish underneath the water shield staggering hunting hunting abilities sometimes they're not such little fish and we had a little question about this one <laughs> we, we were concerned but he was not concerned at all and now we'll walk to oh while we're at it why don't we eat a dragonfly that happens to be flying by you know that's why don't we just open our mouth and have a dragonfly fly in there Oh, that's a nice part of breakfast. Nice little treat. So we're posed here because, or actually poised, I should say, because he's going to do some hunting now. He sees. He plunges. He still is hanging on to that log behind him with his feet. And somehow he's going to get back up <laughs> without going down in the water. This is the second kind of hunting. This is where he sees something in the distance. And off he goes and into the water he goes. And from a distance through the water shield to a fish. Talk about hunting skills. Well, we'll leave him there. And hopefully we're going to see this guy and some of his buddies back at the back at the swamp next year. Time of year to paint me in velvet. <laughs> and I've been following this young buck and wondering what his fate will be in another couple of months. We will still have, of course, lots of fog, cold, cool temperatures here that'll bring out the, the work of the, of the weavers here and the webmasters. This will soon, however, turn to snow, as we know. Um, we're watching for monarchs now. My son-in-law is tagging them. I don't know exactly what number he's up to now. We don't have a lot of caterpillars this year. We only have 60 or 70 caterpillars, um, but we're, we're uh, doing it. We had a deal where the, some of the most productive fields, unfortunately, the timing for haying was not great. Well, it was great for the farmers, but not so great for us getting caterpillars. 
I told you I'd come back to that sulfur butterfly. Now the sulfur butterflies are on aster. As the aster becomes a predominant flower along the roadsides now, along with the goldenrod. And we still wait in the swamp to see the young that were born there. This is one of this year's immatures and the parents who raised them. And I was photographing some yesterday. Um, it's, it's such a delight to see these, to see these uh, marvelous creatures, as you know, my favorite bird. The colors in the abstracts in the water, or I call them watercolors, uh, at the swamp are beginning to happen. The colors will get more intense as time goes on. So eventually, <laughs> eventually we're going to come full circle. I'm sure I ha I'm sorry I have to show this to you in September, but I have to show you, I have to show you where my year is heading eventually into the month of December. And I'll leave you with a, a marvelous mantra from Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets, from a section of her poem that says, instructions for living a life. Pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. And I thank you all for coming in and being part of this this evening. And I'm gonna put this up on the screen. If you wish to uh, get my posts that I send out pretty regularly, uh, just send me your email and I'll put you on my list. Or if you have a question that doesn't get answered this evening, um, feel free to send an email and I, and I will respond. So I will go up and stop my share here. If I can get over here to do it. Oh, stop my share. And there we are. We're back together again. And I, can, can you person, hear me? Yes. One, okay. one of our, one of our uh, listeners asks, as you photograph birds at your feeder in the winter, how do you keep from spooking them? Well, I'm inside the house. You know, I'm, I'm sitting in the kitchen with a nice cup. Here's a nice cup, by the way. You can get one of these on, online from, from Doaz. Um, a nice cup of tea, chai, or whatever. And uh, I, have, I have a panel that has an, an opening for an insert for my camera to go out. And I photograph through the window, not, not literally the window. The lens is out. Um, so they, they, don't, they don't see me. You know, they're... They're pretty, they're pretty cooperative. So you have some sort of a blind then that covers you as you photograph them. Well, yeah, I'm I'm inside I'm inside the house. So as far as they're concerned, that that wall, you know, that you know, that doesn't matter that there's a window there, as you know. You would have to be moving around for them to see movement to startle them. And um, so that if you can do that, if you can work it out. Um, if you need in from just, just, if you have a window that lifts, um, make a panel out of thick, very thick cardboard or something. I used, uh, some insulation on it on both sides, cut a hole in the middle for your lens to go through, figure out a way to, to uh, position that in the window so you can sit there and, and take photographs and put your feeder close and have fun. You know, it's, it's a great time. Another of our listeners asked about your camera. What sort of a camera do you use? What kind of lenses do you have? I use a uh, what's called a bridge camera. Um, all makers make make them. All the significant makers of cameras. I use the Canon SX70. Um, it's a um, uh, a fixed lens camera with no, um, so you, there's no lens changing. 
Uh, it has its, its uh, shortcomings when compared to single lens reflexes or now mirrorless cameras as well. Um, but it suits me well in the field because it's, it's very facile to move from one thing to the other and quickly. Um, it has a macro lens. So um, I would recommend that kind of a camera if you just want a, a get started camera. They sell for $500 or less. So that's not even halfway home to a decent lens for a single lens reflex camera to do the same, to do the same work. So, so it's, not a, it's not a piece of sophisticated equipment. Um, but if you, if you spend time learning what birds do and what other th critters do, uh, that's more important actually than, than having the equipment because <clears throat> proximity is everything. So being able to get close to things and, and understand how a bird is gonna move and what they're gonna do, uh, that's, what, that's what makes photography um, more interesting to me. How long have you been a naturalist? Uh, we know that you were a professor of music. How did you get to be a naturalist as well? <laughs> well, I think I was always a naturalist, but I was too busy doing other things to spend much time outside. I had a sister-in-law who was an ornithologist who recently passed away, unfortunately. And she, um, she, kept, uh, she kept me in contact with, with the bird world. And, um, I, you know, when I, when I retired, I've been a very lucky person. <clears throat> I retired at 60. That was 21 years ago. And um, so I, I've had 21 years to, um, to go fishing every morning, <laughs> but I fish with a camera. You know, when I was a kid, I fished every morning in the summer with a fishing pole. So I've, I've come full circle. And my wife would probably say that I've come full circle in more ways than one, but that's, you know, it's, um, it's a wonderful thing to do. Any camera, any camera, when you go outside, take it with you, take it with you. And, and because you'll get to see things and, and, that you, that you didn't realize were there and it becomes more exciting. You, you look up information about things and that's the way you learn, so. Rick, do you wish to share the location of your swamp? The location of the swamp is on Nurse Hollow Road in, in Afton, New York. Um, <clears throat> it's not, it's private property, but it's a public road and the swamp is very, for those of you that have been there, you know, the swamp is very close to the road. Uh, so you can observe, you can be an observer there. Um, it would be a problem if there were 50 people standing on, on the banks when the, when the great blue herons are, are raising their kids, but it's not a problem when a few are. So if it's a place that you wanna check out, um, Blakesley Nurse Hollow Road, um, between Long Hill Road, and another road. <laughs> um, but if you, if, if you were, you could do that on GPS. And if I'm there, I'll be glad to see you. Rick, there's a lot of great thank yous and accolades um, and appreciation for your presentation tonight as always. Um, I did want to let people know that we did record tonight's session and we will post on our webinars page um, probably early next week. Um, I also have linked um, some of those uh, links in the chat section. So I listed your email address if people want to okay. sign up for your emails. Um, I also listed the DOAS e-news list and our membership um, link. Good. So if anybody has questions, they can certainly feel free to email us um, or get in touch with us through the website and we can kind of uh, respond to any questions that way as well. Um, and if there are any that come in specifically for you, Rick, I'm happy to forward that. Great. Wonderful. Yeah.
and a, a cheers to our panel here. These three people, driving force in the in the organization, and um, long time long time friends, and I'm proud to call them friends. Thank you for having me. You're Thank very you, welcome. Thank you for for sharing with us. Um, it's always a, a, a great experience, and I know everybody really enjoys it. Um, just a quick note um, for Tracy. Tracy, I'm going to forward your question on to Rick. Um, if you wouldn't mind just popping an email address, um, I'll, I'll see if I can find it. If if you're on one of my lists, I should be able to find it through Zoom. Um, so I'll make sure I forward your question over to Rick um, for his, him to respond to you on that. So thank you so much. All right, everybody. My pleasure. We will hope to see you next month for Scott Bidensall um, for 25 years of late nights and wee owls. Um, <laughs> it's sure to be a great program. Been, on the been there and done that. <laughs> been yep. there and done that. That's a Absolutely. wonderful thing. <laughs> okay, beautiful. Thank you all. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night.